Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jay Johnson. Here we are at the uh, the empty sanctuary in uh, rural Illinois. It's the uh, we're celebrating the the 11th of July, 2021. Last week was the uh, 4th of July, and it was a very appropriate reading we had. Um, it was a story where Jeremiah had uh, was told by the Lord to present some words to uh, the king, and the king. Um, in defiance of what the reading was, he took the, the scroll and he actually tore it up and, and burned it. Uh, it seemed pretty appropriate, uh, given the context that it was the 4th of July and it was 245 years ago that the, uh, that the Parliament of England and the King of England were not listening to what the Americans said. And so the Americans... Uh, understandably were justified in their defiance and, and they chose to revolt. And uh, we know all that story. But it ties in. It tied in because when we defy what the Lord wants us to do, um, when we turn our back against what His Word says, what can we expect except um, uh, a harsh punishment? And the King of England, uh, he wasn't because even though he was the king, we now look back upon history and we can see that he was not doing what was best for the nation. Uh, there's a lot of stories we can tell about that. I won't, I won't belabor that point now. But the passage for today uh, we're talking about is uh, it's another really interesting one. The Lord sends Jeremiah, he tells Jeremiah, to send out another, another letter. And this letter... I'll read it to you right now. It's from Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning at verse 1. And it's a really, uh, it's a very famous passage that many people hear, but there's an aspect about it I like to uh, focus on. First, let me uh, read, uh, read the, the passage to you. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests and to the prophets, and to all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those, to those all who I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Meaning the Lord himself has engineered that so they would be going into exile as punishment for their actions. This is what the text says. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Because, uh, excuse me, this is what the Lord Almighty, the Lord, of, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and the diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you, the dreams you are encouraged. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and will fulfill my gracious promise and bring you back to this place. This is verse 11. This is the famous verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future. Verse 12, the next verse says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. Here ends the reading. Another reading we have for the occasion is from Matthew chapter 7. It's also a pretty famous one we've heard many, many times before. It says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asked for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he seek, or if he asked for fish, would you give him a snake? If you, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Here ends the reading. It's a pretty powerful passage. I'd like to just cover a couple of these things. Um, it starts out where Jeremiah uh, is sending his, this letter to the exiles, um, the exiles um, in Babylon. It says to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests and to the prophets. Now, interestingly enough, one of the exiles that was taken at that time, in the first, uh, the first time they had a, uh, a mass exodus that was taken away to Babylon, was the prophet Daniel. So Daniel, he actually receives this letter, and in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, Daniel references this letter that Jeremiah has written to him some years before. Jeremiah has said, this punishment, this exile, will last for 70 years. Daniel references that, and he tells the people years later, Remember what Jeremiah said back in that letter way back when? He said it would last 70 years. We know because God has promised it will not last longer than 70 years. But there was a just punishment. We know that that was the case. I won't get into uh, all the details about that. Suffice it to say, they're a very interesting story why they were exiled. But this is what, this is, this is, I continue with what, uh, what Jeremiah says in this letter. Remember, they're in exile. They don't want to be there. They want to be back home. They want to be back in Jerusalem. They want to be back in the old town. They want to be back where they grew up. But you know what? It's a wreck. Because when they left, uh, when the last time that Nebuchadnezzar left, he, he trashed the place, tore down the temple, tore down the walls. Everything was just a, a jumble of rocks and just a puzzle of pieces on the ground. They couldn't, there wasn't a town there. And we may reminisce about how wonderful it was back in the day, but if it's destroyed, you can never go back. You can go back to the place, but you can't recapture the magic that was there. And quite frankly, there was nothing there. People think that the people that were left behind, one would think that, gee, they were left behind, so it was, wasn't so bad. It was bad. Because all the key people, all the administration, all those things that they were there, that they knew, that, that, that they appreciated, was no longer there. You see, the biggest and the best and the brightest, they came from Jerusalem and in uh, Judea. And in that location, they came to Babylon. Now, this is what it says. And I want you to think about this. It says... Um, Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have your sons and daughters marry as well. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters a marriage so that they too may have children. Increase and do not decrease. Listen to this sentence. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you to exile. Pray to the Lord for, for it because if it prospers, you will prosper. I'd like to give you another slant on that. If it prospers, if that city prospers, then these exiles will prosper. I would offer to you, one of the reasons that it prospers is because those people are there. They are the, they are the choice individuals that know the true God. When the true God and his followers are in that sitting, when they're in that place, and people see the followers of the true God, they watch and they learn. Case in point, uh, two of the exiles that went there was Daniel. And we know what Daniel did. Quickly, Daniel went there, and when he was a young man, probably 16, 17, he, his, his, um, his skills were noticed by Nebuchadnezzar. And his skills and those of his three friends 
You remember the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Those four young men, those four young prophets, prophets because they knew what to say, how to say it, and more, more importantly, and for their time, they knew when to say it, and they said it. And those four individuals were given amazing power over the course of the ruling of, I think it was six different rulers of, of Babylon. Some of them were the Babylonians, but then there were the other people that came in. And these guys, Daniel was at the, he was at the forefront. They readily recognized who he was and the skills that he had because those skills were given to Daniel by God. All right, hang on to that thought. These people had these skills, Daniel and his colleagues. We know through the chapters of the book of Daniel, we know that time after time, Daniel was given the grace of God, the insight. He was able to interpret dreams. He was able to tell the future of Babylon. And so Babylon did prosper in part because Daniel and these other uh, prophets were there. He tells them, uh, he says, uh, uh, also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city. He says, because if they prosper, you will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord God Almighty has said. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Meaning there are going to be those in, among your, your uh, fellow Israelites. They're going to tell you things that they want you to hear. But he says, don't listen because they're prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is a, this is a treasured comment that gave hope to those, uh, those people in exile for 70 years. It says this, This is what the Lord says, When 70 years are completed from Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. They knew that to be the case because Jeremiah was still in the homeland. He was still back in Jerusalem. He was there. But whatever people thought about him, whatever people may have conjured in their heads and what, what whispers were going around, they knew that he was a man of God. And when he spoke, he spoke truth. It really is important to listen to what the man said. This next phrase, this next uh, proclamation is incredibly powerful. And obviously we've heard this, this particular phrase many times, but the, I'd like you to listen to the immediate sentence right after it because it, it enlarges the, the probability, it enlarges the, the, the impact that this prophecy has, that this declaration has, not only on the people there, but on you and I. Here's what it says. And the mission that uh, I'm in, the World Mission Prayer League, we have said this dozens of times, hundreds of times, I've heard this. This is what the passage says. The Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, which is true. And when those plans are given, there's no way around it. Uh, God has those plans. They're already set. He knows what they are. And his will is to be accomplished. When he says that, well, think of it this way. If somebody says they have plans for you, now let's say you're, let's say you're 25 years old, and, and somebody says, "I got plans for you. You're going to take this. You're going to take this big trip. We're going to give you this big trip. We're going to send you this place. We're going to, uh, when that trip is over, we're going to we're going to give you a scholarship to go to the university. We're going to give you the scholarship. It's a great plan for your life. You're going to study these things. You can do these things, and you're going, oh, that's great. That's that's awesome. But what does that mean? It means the plans have been made. But practically, what does that mean for you if, that, if that's been declared to you? Practically, what does that mean? The plans are made for you. Well, the good part is you may, be, uh, you may have a trip planned, but what does that mean? It means you've got to do something. You've got to put yourself into a position where you can get into that vehicle or that mode of transportation and go to the place you're going to go. You come back. 
suppose you've got that scholarship waiting for you at some, some uh, let's say, a prestigious school. What does that mean? They're not just going to give you a diploma. That means you have to go invest your time. You have to go to that place. You have to study. It's going to take you years. They may pay for it, but you're going to have to put in the brain work. You're going to have to, have to do all the writing, all the research, all that studying, all that discussion, all that uh, background discovery. It means it's going to be a lot of work. But, you know, I don't think I've met too many people that would willingly turn down such an offer. Having said that, I'll read that verse again. And then I'll read to you exactly what it says, the next two verses. God says to them, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And a hope. Verse 12, then you will call upon me and will come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Isn't that amazing? When that has been declared, then you will call upon me. You will inquire of me what direction I should take. You will pray to me and I will listen to you. Verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. We'll seek, you know, we'll, we'll dig around, we'll, find, we'll do whatever we can, what's ever necessary to discover what those, those specifics are, what the particulars are that God wants for each one of us. Verse 14, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from ca captivity. That's an interesting phrase. He says, I will be, I will be found by you. We will, I dare I say, we will, we will discover God. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He said, he says, I will be found by you. And there are many people who go, well, I didn't, I didn't know these things could happen. That's what God, <laughs> that's what God does. He reveals himself when we, when we, when we look, when we see. That passage from uh, Matthew chapter 7, seek ye for, uh, excuse me, it says, ask and you shall, it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Pretty good stuff. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. That involves our personal involvement. That means we have to, we have to, so move to be invested in what's going to take place. I'll go back and say this, uh, this last passage, uh, excuse me, verse 11. God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You may remember from a few weeks ago, in the very first, the very first uh, verses we read, in the book of Jeremiah talked about God knew Jeremiah long before he was even thought about. God already knew the book on Jeremiah. If God knows the book on Jeremiah, he knows the book on you and me. He knew eons before I was, be I was born that I would sit in this chair today and read this passage to you. He knows every day of our life. He knows what we're going to eat tomorrow. He knows what anxieties we go through this evening. He knows the pain that will be perpetrated on nations around the world. He knows all that. And you know what he's continually doing? He's sending us letters, letters like this. I know this was written a long time ago. And obviously this was written by Jeremiah for the purpose of informing his friends. These letters were sent to his friends that were exiles in Babylon to give them hope and a future. And that's exactly what this says. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. We have a hope. Today, uh, we have two little children that are going to be baptized. It's uh, Aria Walsh and Luther Frerichs. These two little kids, uh, they were born last October, uh, one on the 5th of October, 
and Luther was born on the 6th of October. God knows the plans for them. They have been given a hope. Uh, I would ask that you would pray for them. Aria, Aria Walsh, and Luther Frerichs. These two young children, many of us will not be around when they get into college, when they start having their families. We don't need to be. <laughs> uh, when the Lord calls us, why would we want to hang around here? It's time to go. It's also time to move right now. It's time to move. It's time to share these things with the people that we know. With the people that we know, they need to hear the truth of these words. I'm simply, I'll, I'll just, I'll finish with this few comments and then I'll, we'll finish with a prayer. For these last several weeks and for the next several weeks, we've got this picture. This is the picture that's on the front of the bulletin. Jeremiah is sitting in the city of Jerusalem, which has been destroyed. Uh, I'm not a prophet of doom. This is what Jeremiah went through. The Lord tells us we need to, 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 to respond to what he, what he says. He speaks to us clearly through his son. There's four ways by which we know what God's will is. There's four ways. We've covered this before. I'll, I've mentioned this before. God shows, shows us in his creation what his will is. He shows us the wonder we can respond to what God shows us. He gives us his son. His son Jesus has spoken to us. We have his words. We know what his words are. We know the example of his life. I believe those words are true. I believe his life was true. I believe it was a reflection of God's, the Father's presence in his life. We have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. The Holy Spirit instructs us. If we stop and we listen, we, we, if we are attentive to what he says, he will inform our lives and he will give us directions. If you simply ask the Holy Spirit to tell you, he'll tell you. And the last thing we have, the last of the four things, is the Word of God itself. People say, well, that's too hard to read. It's just too difficult. You know, it's, it's really difficult when you never pick it up. It's really difficult to know what it says if you never bother to read it. Or have somebody read it to you. Lots of programs, just hit the, pre uh, hit the button and listen to it read to you. And, this, and the Spirit of God speaks through those words. That's the way it is. I say these things. Uh, we've got a few more lessons. Uh, 11, we've got uh, two more Sundays. We're going to be continuing to talk about the book of Jeremiah. So uh, let, let's finish up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your presence with us. We ask that you would please allow us to consider what your words say. This is Jeremiah chapter 29. My prayer is that the people listening now, they would take that text, they would... They would read the text of that scripture, read Jeremiah 29. They would, they know a bit about it. And may your spirit speak through those words and to their hearts. This can happen. This can happen right now. When this video is over, they can just, they can hit the, hit the stop button. They can take that scripture out and read that. And Father, it will be even better. I'm just, I'm just a guy sitting in a building and, in a, in the middle of uh, some farmland. But you are the Most High God. You desire to speak to into their very hearts. May that be the case, Father. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. May those who are listening right now, may they ask of you, may they ask of you so that you may make the way clear for them, that they would know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Most High God who took care of the exiles, the exiles in and Babylon takes care of us as well because we are exiles just as well as they are. We think we, are, we think we know who we are. We weren't originally from this land. It didn't belong to us. We came as exiles to this place. And there's many among us, many among us right now that feel as though they're in exile because they don't feel like they belong. We can ask a lot of people and they'll say that. I don't really belong here. I don't know where I belong, but I don't feel... I don't feel I'm welcome here. 
Many people say that. They may not say that in Royal Illinois, but there are many people in various places that just feel awkward. They want to know that they're home. They want to know that Christ is with them. They want to know the Spirit of God embraces them. They want to know that in the deepest and most precious of ways. Father, it's our prayer. Our prayer. I'm in this sanctuary by myself, but it's our prayer because there are many that are praying right now even as I'm saying this. Many of those that are listening to this right now are praying with me. Those of you that are listening, if you're participating in this, you are praying. These words are, they may come from my lips, but these words are not even mine. They belong to God's Spirit. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 19, it says, Don't worry about what you'll say, because it is not you that speaks. It is the Spirit of my Father. It is His words. Gracious Father, watch over us. Clue us in. May we be attentive. May we be obedient. May we follow you. And may we rejoice. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Whoa. Thanks for being with us. Blessings to you. Um, see you next week. Take care. Bye now.